Welcome, everyone. Ready to dive into something pretty wild. We're talking eternal energy today. Eternal energy. Yeah, eternal energy. Sounds ambitious. It is. It is. We've got these excerpts from a document. But the crazy thing is it reads like a blueprint for a future where energy, well, it doesn't just sustain, it multiplies. Hold on, multiplies? Like, we're not just talking solar panels and windmills here. Nope, this is next level. Think about it, from muscle power to, you know, like, windmills, fossil fuels, solar. Humanity's always been trying to control and grow the energy we've got, right? Yeah, makes sense. Always looking for more. Exactly. But this document, it flips the script entirely. How so? Instead of just swapping out fossil fuels for renewables, it says we need to completely rethink energy's role. Rethink it how? Imagine an energy system that actually makes more energy than it uses. Wait, so it's not just about, like, efficiency. It's about, I don't know, surplus. Yeah. The document calls it energy compounding, like game changer territory. Yeah, right? definitely a new concept. So how do they propose we do that? That's where it gets really interesting. Space, apparently, is key. Space, as in outer space? The final frontier and all that. It says that in a zero-gravity environment... A motor generator system could basically run with almost perfect efficiency. Okay, I'm following. Less gravity, less friction, less energy loss. Exactly. But then it gets even wilder because that's where superconductivity comes in. Ah, uh, right. Conducting electricity with, like, zero resistance. Yeah. But didn't that require crazy low temperatures? Yeah, which is why space is perfect. It's got those ultra-low temps naturally. The document's basically saying, combine zero gravity with superconductivity and boom, incredibly efficient energy systems in orbit. So giant power plants in space. That's a big leap. Totally. But here's the question that popped into my head. How do we get that energy back to Earth? Good point. Beaming it down. Sounds like sci-fi stuff. It does. But the document mentions this thing called resonant inductive coupling. Resonant what now? Yeah. That's a mouthful. I know, right? But apparently it's based on resonance, something we actually experience all the time. Resonance. Like how? Think of a tuning fork. You hit one, and another nearby, if it's tuned to the same frequency, starts vibrating too, even without touching it. Ah, yeah, I've seen that. So apply that to energy transfer. You create a matching frequency between a transmitter in space and a receiver on Earth, and you can send power wirelessly across huge distances. So like an invisible energy beam. That's wild. Totally. And while it sounds like something out of Star Trek, the science behind it is solid. In fact, we're already using resonant inductive coupling in smaller ways, like wireless charging pads and even some medical implants. Interesting. But scaling that up to power, well, everything. That's a whole other challenge, isn't it? For sure. But let's say, for argument's sake, that we managed to pull it off. What would a world running on this eternal energy actually look like? That's the big question, right? This, this yeah. document, it doesn't just stop at the technology. It goes into how it could change, well, pretty much everything. Okay, I'm all ears. Where do we even begin? Well, it starts with economics. Think about it. Mm -hmm. If energy is basically free, the cost of making, well, anything would plummet. Right. Global markets, trade... Everything is turned upside down. Wow, yeah. Developing countries, they could finally compete on a level playing field. Exactly. Industries that need tons of energy, like manufacturing, their costs would drop drastically. It'd be like hitting the reset button on the global economy. In a way, yeah. But it goes beyond just economics, too. Think about the environmental impact. Oh, right. If we're not burning fossil fuels anymore. Exactly. Our carbon footprint shrinks massively. Mm -hmm. But it's not just about preventing more damage. It's about actually healing the planet. Healing it how? Reforestation on a huge scale. Cleaning up the oceans. Restoring ecosystems that have been damaged. All of that becomes way more doable with access to clean, abundant energy. It's like we shift from an era of scarcity and competition to an era of, well, almost like cooperation and abundance. Yeah, the document uses some pretty strong language, almost utopian. But it's not naive. It does acknowledge that this kind of energy abundance, it wouldn't come without its own challenges. Like what? What are some of the potential downsides? Well, for one thing, it says that achieving this, managing this level of energy, it would require a massive change in how we think, how we approach things. So it's not just building the tech, it's about building a whole new way of life almost. Yeah, exactly. A world where energy isn't something we fight over, but a tool for positive change. And that's a big shift. It's a lot to wrap your head around, that's for sure. But, all right, let's back up a bit. This energy compounding idea, how does that actually work? The document compares it to ecosystems and even financial systems, which is interesting. Right, it's about using energy to generate even more energy. Think about a forest, for example. Trees use sunlight to grow. 
then their leaves provide food for insects and so on. Right. Each part of the system builds on the one before it, like a chain reaction. Yeah. It's all about energy reinvestment and expansion. And the document says we can apply that same idea to create human-made energy systems that are just as efficient as natural ones. So instead of just using energy to meet demand, we reinvest some of it to make even more energy. Exactly. It's like compound interest, where your money earns interest, and then that interest earns more interest, creating a snowball effect. Ah, I see. So by applying the principles of compounding to energy, we could create this cycle of ever-increasing energy production. Precisely. But of course, to make that work, we need to tackle the issue of energy loss, which is where zero gravity and superconductivity come in. Right, because here on Earth, every time we can convert or transmit energy, we lose some as heat because of friction and resistance. Exactly. But in space, with minimal gravity and superconductive materials, we can practically eliminate those losses. So these space stations wouldn't just be generating energy, they'd be multiplying it. Okay, yeah, my mind is officially blown. Ah. This is some next level stuff. And believe it or not, we've only scratched the surface. The document goes into even more detail about the actual technology and the engineering feats needed to make this all happen. Well, I for one can't wait to hear more. This is definitely a deep dive I won't be forgetting anytime soon. So last time we were talking about these space stations, like multiplying energy, using zero gravity, superconductivity, and the sun's power. Yeah, pretty radical concept, right? Totally radical. But yeah. what I'm curious about is like the actual design of these stations. What would they even look like? How do you build something that complex in space? Well, the document actually gets into the nuts and bolts of it, and it proposes yeah. a pretty clever solution modularity modularity like building blocks yeah exactly think of it like legos in space okay. each station would be made up of separate modules that you launch individually and then connect once they're in orbit ah so it's like a giant space construction set that actually makes a lot of sense considering how hard it is to build anything in space <laughs> right and the modular design would be really flexible too you could start with a smaller station and then expand it over time by adding more modules as you go so it's not just a fixed structure. It's like a system that can grow and evolve over time. Yeah, exactly. And you could swap out modules for repairs or upgrades or even reconfigure the whole station for different purposes as needed. That's really cool. So let's zoom in on those individual modules for a second. What would they actually contain? Each module would basically be a self-contained unit with everything it needs for energy generation, storage, and transmission. Okay, so like a mini power plant in space. Exactly. And at the core of each module, you'd have the motor generator system, the one that's designed to operate with that near-perfect efficiency we were talking about, thanks to the zero gravity and superconductivity. Right. Those motor generators will be spinning constantly, churning out clean energy. But what's actually powering them? Where's the initial energy coming from? Well, according to the document, the main energy source would be the sun. Each module would have a big array of solar panels constantly collecting solar energy. Ah, so it's like a giant orbital solar farm, but supercharged by zero gravity and superconductivity. Exactly. And space is the perfect place for solar panels because there are no clouds or nighttime to interrupt the flow of energy. Makes sense. Okay, so we've got energy generation taken care of. What happens to all that energy once it's been generated? Well, each module would also have some pretty advanced energy storage systems. The document mentions possibilities like, you know, advanced batteries, supercapacitors, even systems that store energy in magnetic fields. Magnetic fields? That sounds like something out of a sci-fi movie. It does sound futuristic, but the science behind it is solid. These magnetic energy storage systems can store huge amounts of energy in a relatively small space, and they're super efficient. Actually, they're already being researched and developed for use here on Earth. Wow, that's pretty cool. So we've got energy generation, energy storage, and now the big question. How do we get all that energy from these space stations back down to Earth? That's where the resonant inductive coupling comes in. Remember that tuning fork example? Yeah, the one where the forks vibrate without even touching. Well, each module would have a transmitter that creates a specific resonant frequency. And back on Earth, we'd have receivers tuned to that exact same frequency, creating that invisible energy bridge we were talking about. Okay, I'm following. But isn't beaming that much energy through the atmosphere kind of dangerous? What about like birds or airplanes? That's a valid concern, and the document does acknowledge that. It stresses the need for, you know, really rigorous safety protocols and careful engineering. The idea is to design the system in a way that minimizes any risks to wildlife or air traffic. So it's not just about transmitting energy, it's about transmitting it safely and responsibly. Exactly. And another concern that people might have is security. 
how do we prevent unauthorized access to this energy beam? Right. Like, what's to stop someone from setting up their own receiver and just, like, siphoning off energy? Well, the document suggests that the whole energy transmission system would be tightly controlled. Each receiver would need specific authorization and authentication to access the beam. Ah, so it'd be like a secure energy network with safeguards in place to prevent hacking or energy theft. Yeah, precisely. The document outlines a multi-layered system that would make sure the energy is delivered securely and reliably to wherever it's needed. That makes sense. Okay, but this is still incredibly ambitious, right? Who would actually build these space stations? And how would we even get all the materials and equipment up into space in the first place? Well, the document envisions it as a global effort, with countries pooling their resources, expertise, and technology. It argues that a project of this scale would require international collaboration on a level we've never seen before. So it wouldn't just be an energy project, it would be a massive peace project, bringing the world together to work towards a common goal. Exactly. And as for getting all that stuff into space, the document points to advancements in things like reusable rockets and space planes, as well as the possibility of developing in-space manufacturing capabilities, where we'd actually build the stations directly in orbit. Wow, so it sounds like we're not just talking about harnessing the power of the sun, but also the power of human ingenuity and collaboration. That's a great way to put it. This energy compounding infrastructure would really be a testament to what we can achieve when we work together towards a common goal. You've definitely painted a compelling picture. But let's talk about the bigger picture now. How would this energy abundance actually impact the world? That's what we'll dive into next. From global economics and environmental sustainability to potential social and cultural changes, prepare to have your mind blown once again. Okay, so we've talked about the science and the engineering, the how-to of eternal energy. Right, the nuts and bolts. But what I'm really curious about is, like, the impact. How could this change the world, you know, on a big scale? That's where things get really interesting. Because this document, it doesn't just propose a new energy source. It's like a whole new way of thinking about, well, everything. Economics, the environment, even our role as, you know, humans on this planet. All right, lay it on me. Paradigm shift time. Paradigm shift, exactly. Let's start with the economics. Energy is the foundation of pretty much every industry, right? So what happens when that becomes practically free? Yeah, costs would plummet. Manufacturing, transportation, everything. Everything. It completely reshaped global markets, trade, the whole system. I can imagine. Developing countries, they'd have a real chance to catch up. Exactly. Leveling the playing field. And industries that rely heavily on energy, manufacturing especially, they'd see massive growth. It'd be a total game changer. But you said it changes how we think about prosperity too, right? What did you mean by that? Well, think about it. Right now, our economies are all about scarcity. Competing for limited resources, which drives prices up, leads to conflict. But with abundant energy, that whole mindset could shift. We could focus on innovation, collaboration, instead of just, you know, fighting over scraps. So instead of a shrinking pie, everyone gets a bigger slice. More like we bake a whole new pie. We could focus on developing new technologies, solving global problems, improving quality of life for everyone. And that shift, it wouldn't just impact economics. Think about the environment. Right. We talked about that a bit, but I'd love to hear more. How would eternal energy change our approach to climate change? It'd be huge. No more reliance on fossil fuels, so our carbon footprint shrinks drastically. But it goes further than that. With this much clean energy, we could actively start healing the planet reforestation on a massive scale, cleaning up the oceans, restoring ecosystems that we've damaged. So we're not just slowing down climate change, we're reversing it. Potentially, yeah. It's a powerful idea. But it does raise some questions too, like, wouldn't this lead to even more consumption? What's stopping people from just using more and more energy? Right. It's like, is human nature just going to take over? That's a valid concern. And the document addresses it. It emphasizes the need for responsible energy use, a cultural shift towards sustainability, being mindful of consumption, even with abundance. So it's not a free pass to use as much energy as we want. It's about using it wisely. Exactly. Recognizing that this is an opportunity to create a more balanced relationship with our planet, not just exploit it even more. This is all starting to sound pretty utopian, but is it really possible? Can we overcome all the, you know, political and social roadblocks to make this happen? The document doesn't pretend those challenges don't exist. It acknowledges that this kind of transformation, it would require global cooperation on a scale we've never seen before. A willingness to, you know, change how we think, how we live. So it's not just building the technology, it's building a whole new world. 
Yeah, a world where energy isn't a source of conflict, but a driver of progress. A world where we can work together to solve global problems and create a better future for everyone. It's a powerful vision. This whole deep dive, it's been a wild ride. We've covered the science, the engineering, the economics, the environmental impact, even the philosophy of it all. My mind is officially blown. Mine too. And I think it's fitting to end with the document's closing thought. It asks, what would a world of abundance look like? What role would we play in creating it? And what ethical considerations would you prioritize? Those are big questions. They make you think beyond the technology itself about the kind of future we want. A future where this energy abundance helps us create a more just, sustainable world for everyone. That's the dream, right? And this document, it gives us a possible path to get there. It's something worth exploring, debating, and, you know, striving for. Absolutely. This deep dive has given me a lot to chew on, and I hope it's done the same for you, our listeners. Until next time, keep exploring, keep questioning, and keep dreaming big.